spiritual maturity, the Christian walk, Pauline example, faith, hope, love, faithfulness and afflictions, church growth, comfort, prophecy, the rapture, and much more. Welcome to the Weekly Wholesome Words Podcast, where we examine the sound doctrine in God's Word for the specific purpose to know Christ, gain the renewing of our mind, that we might prove His will in our lives, that all things would work together for His purpose. I am Josh Strelecki, pastor and teacher of Twin Cities Grace Fellowship. Join me as we journey through Thessalonians. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Weekly Wholesome Words Podcast. I'm Josh Strelecki, I'm the pastor and the teacher at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship. What a privilege it is to open up God's Word with you. And we are continuing our journey through Thessalonians. This is episode number 83. As we continue our journey through Thessalonians, now in chapter 4. And I titled this episode, Despise Not God's Call. And we're going to see what that call is and how Paul utilizes that for them to continue to abound more and more in in love and charity towards one another. Last episode, I took the time to uh, go through verse 1, utilizing it as Paul is, this bridge verse from his prayer in chapter 3 to now his exhortation. And he's going to now take that issue of the furthermore abound more and more um, and begin to spell it out a little bit more and explain it. Uh, so let's get right into this episode as we look at First Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, we'll pick it up here in verse 1, and then we'll move on to verse 2. He says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would more abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, we have also have forewarned you, as we also have forewarned you and testified. We'll stop there because of the the period. Um, Paul, in verse 2, begins to explain his exhortation in verse 1 and further explains it in verses 3 through 7. And again, the Thessalonians, uh, being these mature believers, manifest in their work of faith, their labor of love, and their patience of hope. Essentially, in their belief and understanding of the truth, the expression of that in their behavior, their works towards one another, and doing it in the face of afflictions and suffering. That now Paul in chapter 4, as he prays for them in chapter 3, that the Lord make you to increase and abound in love uh, one toward another and toward all men. He now exhorts them to abound more and more. And he is going to bring uh, some things in here to uh, firm up, to to steady that exhortation. And the reason why he also needs to exhort them for that. Verse 2, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Oftentimes uh, in the church, when there's an understanding of, of the distinction between not being under the law, but being under grace. We, we liken commandments only to that of the law. Yet there's commandments under God's grace. And there can be commandments under God's grace because it's under God's grace. And therefore the flavor and the mechanics of these commandments work differently because they're under God's grace, compared to the the flavor and the mechanics of the commandments under the law. So we know that the law and the commandments, they're they're holy, just, and good. Yet the law worked through the flesh. 
Therefore, you have the structure of a commandment, thou shalt not. Here it is up to you not to do this. And yet under God's grace, grace not only upholds that law, but comes along and says, I have the, I have the provision, I have the, the doctrine, the knowledge you need to do what the law couldn't do. And therefore, the exhortation, how to walk and to please God, is one that can be upheld. It can be done, not in and of one's own strength, but by virtue of the grace, by virtue of Christ, by virtue of the, the work of faith. And so, um, with those that are under grace, we don't need to shy away from the issue of the commandment. We just need to understand these are commandments under God's grace. And therefore, they're not walk, they're, it's not an issue of walking after the flesh in our own strength. It's the issue of walking after the Spirit in the, spirit, in the strength of the Spirit. Now, what are these commandments uh, that they gave by the Lord Jesus? Well, we're going to see it here in this chapter. But ultimately, it's going to come back to this issue of love once again. But we'll see the commandments here. And he's going to further explain it in verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. So this is part of the commandment given by the Lord Jesus. Abstain from fornication. This abstaining from fornication is part of their sanctification. It's the part of their separation. Remember, that this love abounding toward one another, in as we see in First Thessalonians chapter three and verse twelve, the end of it in verse thirteen is that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. Sanctification and holiness really go hand in hand. Uh, sanctification is a separation from something to something else, and a separation from something to something else means that there is a there's a holiness involved, whatever the context may be. There's that separation. Here, fornication is not something that Paul's praying that the Lord would make us to establish our hearts in. This is in contrast to the end of our hearts being unblameable in holiness before God. Therefore, the, com the commandment to abstain from it under God's grace. This is the will of God, in fact, he says in verse 3. Even your sanctification, this, this separation from that which you were, that he set the tone for when he made you dead to sin and alive unto him. That our walk is to follow suit, how we ought to walk and to please God. Fornication does not please God. Doesn't, doesn't mean it's not forgivable. It, it doesn't mean that it can't be uh, mortified. It doesn't mean that it can't have we can't have victory over. Yet the very thing that it, of its of itself, fornication, and the 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 of course what's going to be taking place in the heart and the act of it, this does not please God. Uh, that's a no brainer. But it needs to be noted because there's some who think that under God's grace, we can just live however we want, and uh, you can tell those people don't read their apostle. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm sorry, chapter 5. And we see this issue here of fornication. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. You see the pattern of love here in 1 Thessalonians to that of Ephesians. He says, as Christ also hath loved us. How are you going to abstain from fornication? Love others like Christ loved you. Don't live in a, in a manner that uh, rejoices in iniquity. For love, charity, does not rejoice in iniquity. Does not, does not pursue itself. Pursue someone else. So, don't, so abstain from fornication by virtue of, of love. Verse 2, Ephesians 5, And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savor. But fornication, 
and all uncleanness. Uh, uncleanness is the opposite of holiness. Holiness is going to line up with cleanness and, and sanctification. He says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. And he goes on to talk about that the wrath of God comes upon those who are in Adam doing that, essentially. So, Back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Ab abstain from the sexual lewdness. But even more so, the way he describes fornication, it almost lends to a, a, a greater or more comprehensive view of fornication. There, there are some contexts that talk about fornication in regards to like spiritual fornication. Uh, spiritual fornication being the issue of, of having relationship with God and yet having relationship spiritually with other things. So like the Colossians, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, uh, vain deceit, tradition of men, right? The rudiments of the world that not after Christ. So those things spoil you because they're not after Christ. And so if you base your relationship with God on those things, there's a there's this fornication that's going on. There's a relationship that you're having that is not with Jesus Christ and it's not with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be saved, but your walk is a spiritual fornication. So there is, in one sense, the way that he talks about it, it could, it could be a more a comprehensive view of, of fornication. However, um, verse 5 tends to lend back to this issue of sexual lewdness when he says, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Whatever the case may be, the, the, whether it's sexual lewdness, whether it's spiritual fornication, or whether it's engaging in things uh, simply that you're not supposed to be engaging in, by virtue of the relationship with God, he says, abstain from it. Come over to Titus chapter 3. This is all consistent with God's grace. Titus chapter uh, 2, excuse me, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, lust of concupiscence, of fornication, uh, the issue of of covetousness, there's uncleanness. Over in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, remember he says, as uh, in verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, we see in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 17, This I say there, testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. And he goes on to describe their understanding darkened and the blindness of their heart. In verse 19, Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with Greediness. We see the uncleanness issue and, and the greediness and the, and the coveting. Well, back to First Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. God's will is for you to be sanctified. You be separate from the things he says to be separate from. And fornication is one, and therefore you are commanded, you are told to abstain from from fornication. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. My understanding, that is the issue of, of, of your body. Possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That's going back up to chapter 4 and verse 1, that you received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. And he's reminding them of that. Abstain from fornication Fornication is not possessing your vessel in sanctification and honor. And the will of God is for your sanctification. 
from your denial, your mortification of the deeds of the body, your putting off of things, your casting off, your abstaining in this context of fornication. Instead of bringing, instead bring honor to the things of God and to God himself. Bringing honor to others instead of taking advantage, utilizing them for your own loss. Verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence. That's utilized over in Romans chapter 7. When Paul is talking about the law, it's the one commandment he brings up. To talk about the work of the law in regards to one's life. And he says in verse 7, of Romans 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So you got covet. Coveting is lusting. And then he says, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. So this, this issue of concupiscence is the issue of lust. It's the issue of, of coveting here in 1 Thessalonians 4. It can be in the issue of the sexual lewdness. And that, that coveting, of course, is, is that Ephesians 4 greediness. It, it stands in contrast to selflessness and to love. Sexual fornication, of course, is uh, whether it be the issue of, of sex before marriage or outside of marriage when you are married. That's, we have another term for that, adultery, is the establishment of a relationship that, that God has not framed. And doing something in a relationship that God has not framed. And, and therefore, when you, when you do that, all you're doing in regards to those commandments, in regards to that framework that's, that's teaching you that if I do that, I've, I've crossed over into the issue of, of self and sin. And, and what's going to combat that? What's going to fight against that is not only the abstaining from it, but the issue that Paul's going to bring up is the issue of love. So instead of possessing your vessel and just allowing the free course of these lusts to run rampant within you and exploring them and, and letting, as the proverb says, or the psalmist says, your heart discover itself. You, you possess your vessel and, and you, you're going to keep your mind and your heart and you're going to exercise those things in charity that when you come across someone, you, it, instead of crossing over into sin, you're going to honor and you're going to participate in a, in a, a separate conduct and behavior than that in which the world engages in, that which we once did engage in and we can still engage in. And that is exclusively highlighting that the power and the grace of God in your life, because that's where it's coming from. And when you engage in that, abstaining and, and possessing of your vessel rightly in sanctification and honor, that is the will of God. That's the will of God for your life. This is how the Gentiles who know not God walked. Romans chapter 1, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Later on, it says in verse 28, these man, this, these Gentiles, verse 28 of Romans 1, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, so on, so on. It goes on and on and on. The ones that know not God, therefore the things in which he says they know not as well. 
The will of God, however, and one who knows the will of God is the one who abstains from fornication, knows how to possess their vessel in sanctification and honor, and utilizes it to God's honor and glory. Now, there's a, a warning here and an admonition that follows this exhortation of abounding more and more and the hindrances for the Thessalonians of what would make them not abound more and more. This, for instance, this issue of fornication. And he says this in verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. That's where I go back and forth about this issue of fornication, if I'm just honest with you. It, 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 it seems to encompass this issue of, of sexual lewdness, but it's also this seems like this issue of going beyond and defrauding your brother in any matter. In other words, fornication to to engage in some God forbidden relationship, some illicit relationship. For example, of illicit relationship, God forbidden relationship, is to be in a relationship in which you defraud your brother. How do I defraud them? By not honoring them. Uh, look at Romans chapter 1 again. I know I brought this up before. What, what do we mean by honor? God made man... Male and female made he them. To, to highlight in marriage, of course, a, a relationship. Then they were to have children, be fruitful and multiply. And there's a relationship unlike marriage, but similar in the sense of it's a relationship of from the parents to the children. And, and once man began to populate the earth, you had this, this issue of, um, you had this issue of, of, of government and you have all these relationships and yet God sets the tone. He, he gives the, the boundaries, if you will, the, the good boundaries. And, and, and they're not even boundaries in one sense. They're only boundaries in the sense of when you start moving to this issue of sin, but the, the it's there because Outside of that is not God. Outside of that is dishonor. Inside of this is, is where the honor is. This is where this is where God is. This is his will. This is what he desires. This is what he commands. This is what he is pleased with. This is what is for our good. And what did man begin to do? Well, we see with Adam and Eve, they start to go outside of that, right? But look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. That doesn't even go into the issue of the homosexuality listed in verse 26 and 27. That's just the issue that we are doing things one with another that is dishonoring to, how, to why God gave us bodies and why God gave us one another. And where that all is supposed to be redeemed is in the church and then to be shown by the church to the world. That you might love one another and toward all men. Therefore, the, the dishonor is going outside of the good parameters. And in one sense, the, the only way or ways in which God says we can have these relationships. When we defraud, coming back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when we defraud and go beyond our brother in any matter, we're, we're committing a fornication because we're, which is what sexual lewdness is. But we're operating with someone in a way in which we should not. We should not because it's not the will of God. And it's not the will of God because the way in which he wants us to operate is reflective of love. And that love is 
determined and dictated and manifest and revealed by God himself, who is love. So anything outside of the honor, anything outside of how God says, does not fit in the realm of love. Therefore, is dishonor. And so the admonition, the warning, verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. In the gospel, this is warned and testified. If, if you don't get these things settled, if you don't have the, the debt of your sins paid for, which are paid for by Christ and then imputed, when you believe the gospel, then his wrath is coming upon you. His wrath is upon you. Condemnation. And it will be for all eternity. And for the church, if you're engaged in these things, you're not building up the church. Sin in the life of the believer is a constant deterrent of what Christ is building. It goes in contrast to our walk. And although we won't be judged for our sins, sin hinders what we are supposed to be doing. And therefore we will suffer loss. These are things that God is not pleased with. And therefore, they must be burnt in the fire. Which is what will happen at the judgment seat of Christ. This, this work towards our brethren in defrauding one another in fornication as we live in the lust of concupiscence as a believer is not the will of God. It is not possessing our vessel in sanctification and honor. That's walking like the Gentiles instead of walking like the one who belongs to their king, their Lord, their Savior. One who's walking like the kingdom of this world instead of the kingdom of his dear son. One who's walking still in an earthly conversation instead of a heavenly one. Let's go on. He's going he's gonna to avenge it. And he's forewarned you and testified of that. Where did Paul do this at the first with the Thessalonians? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look at verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. It's coming against what you're participating in. And now you have started to love one another, abound more and more, and don't even defraud one another. Don't even engage in that. Because his wrath is still against that. And although we're forgiven all of our sins, we just spend our time building that up. We will suffer loss. Why? Verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Remember, Chapter 3, in his prayer at the end of verse 13, the end, the Lord increasing us to abound in love one toward another, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with the saints. The end goal is when Christ returns, that our hearts are unblameable in holiness before God. Here, the Thessalonians have fornication. Here, they're going beyond and they're defrauding their brother in matters. And Paul is comprehensively dealing with it. There's a people who's going to receive his wrath for those things. Don't walk like them who know not God. Walk like those that know God. Don't walk like those that possess their vessel in uncleanness, but possess your vessel in, in cleanness. Because God hath called you to holiness. 
You are holy in Christ. And the issue is of perfecting that holiness. Positionally, you're holy. Everything that you need in Christ, you, you, you are. But the issue is you're a walk. Please, God. He's called you unto holiness. You are holy. Walk holy. Not unto uncleanness. That's not what he's called us to. And look at his conclusion in verse 8. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth, but what the, the, the frowning and, and scowling upon the, the, the issue of cleanness and, and holiness. Uh, the one who is not concerned about the Lord as the avenger of all such in which he is doing. The one who knows the will of God and how one is supposed to abstain from fornication and possess this vessel in sanctification and honor, and yet, yet he's despising this. He, he's not struggling with it. and he, It's not that he doesn't know that this is wrong, this, but, but one that is despising this. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to lead us into holiness, sanctification, honor, the will of God. And so the one who is rejecting and neglecting the exhortation and the admonition isn't despising Paul. They're ultimately despising God. We don't want to be in that position as believers. We don't want to despise God. Remember who he's given you, and he hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The body is not for fornication, but the Lord for the body. First Corinthians. Well, I'm going to stop there for this episode. We're going to pick it up. Touching brotherly love. They already have some of the things, these things going, and he calls upon that. He's, he's exhorted them. Now he's admonished them. And he's told them, warned them, to not go a certain direction, but instead abound more and more. And that's what he's going to pick up now here in verses 9 through 12 and we'll deal with that next episode i hope that in this episode you've you've sensed the gravity and the sobriety that comes with being given the holy spirit the the gravity and the surprise the sobriety that comes with the, the issue of belonging to the lord and the lord avenging all fornication the gravity and the sobriety of having a vessel to possess in sanctification and honor instead of fornication and cleanness and greediness, covetousness. This is not an issue of whether you lose your salvation or not. You see, the context is all about those that have believed and those that have walked. But there is a certain walk that the believer ought to walk in. That if you don't, there are gracious consequences. The things you do or don't abstain in or from matter. And the things that you possess your vessel in or not today matters. The Spirit of God impresses that upon the mind and the heart through the Word of God. So that we, by His strength, and by His power, by His love, by His instruction and His Word, would deny and live. Deny the world and lust and ungodliness and live unto God for His honor 
his glory and to all pleasing. Well, we'll take a look at more at touching brotherly love in the next episode. Until then, look up. Thank you.